Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the sixth and final webinar of our Inflammation and Immunophysiology webinar series brought to you by Inside Scientific, the American Physiological Society, and the Autoimmune Association. This is Liam Sanyo from Inside Scientific, and I'm very pleased to be your host for today's event. This webinar is titled Immunophysiological Mechanisms that Limit Dissemination of Microbial Signals from the Intestine, and will feature Dr. Gwendolyn Randolph, professor in the Department of Pathology and Immunology at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Today, Professor Randolph will be discussing strategies in the intestine, uh, strategies that the intestine uses to limit the dissemination of inflammatory signals in the venous and lymphatic vascul vasculature. All right, and with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Gwendolyn Randolph. Uh, Gwen, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can you confirm that um, my sound is okay? I can indeed. Yeah, you sound great. Yeah, great, great, great. So um, um, this title slide, uh, actually, I had made a, a title slide uh, that's similar. And on this slide, actually, you can see a picture on the right uh, that is um, an image of the gut and the gut itself, the tissue of the gut looks really bright green. And you can see um, lymphoid tissue that is in the uh, lower part of the tissue. And, that, and we're gonna talk about that today that is outside of the gut. Uh, and we're gonna consider um, how the intestine, which can be uh, uh, certainly a major interface with a microbial world, uh, limits dissemination um, of microbes and inflammatory signals from the intestine. And these lymphoid structures will be one of uh, the features of the discussion today. Um, and these are connected to the lymphatic vasculature. Uh, and the lymphatic vasculature is an area of, of really growth in our understanding in the last couple of decades. And its connection to inflammation is something my laboratory is very interested in. So I'm going to focus today on a couple of mechanisms that are recently developing in our laboratory related to the general concept of, of how the gut manages dissemination of, uh, of inflammatory signals. So let me start uh, with uh, introducing the lymphatic vasculature in a, a basic way. Um, actually, in this image, if you fir first focus on panel B, um, what you're seeing is this cartoon of a tissue where uh, the blood capillaries have allowed for macromolecules uh, to leave and in some cases you know leukocytes in the context of inflammation will enter tissues and typically the dissemination of these molecules and leukocytes tissue out uh, uh, bound wise will occur through uh, the lymphatic vasculature and the lymphatic vasculature uh, is not a loop, as you can see in panel A, but a, a unidirectional system of blind ended vessels, um, probably easiest to see in panel B, uh, that allow for the uptake of these cells and molecules. And one of their features is discontinuous junctions that are uh, features like buttons um, between the spaces of, say, on a shirt, you have openings that allow for entry. Now, in panel C, the types of vessels uh, that are downstream of these initial lymphatics are shown. And actually all the pictures on the left are showing this type of vessel called a collecting lymphatic vessel. So this type of vessel is uh, um, uh, downstream and, and coalescing many uh, additional lymph uh, initial lymphatics. Um, and the features of these vessels are that they have valves to promote unidirectional flow toward lymph nodes, which you can see in both panel A and D. Um, and this uh, propulsion is promoted by a muscular coverage, uh, abbreviated here as SMC. Um, and indeed, the video that you see playing is the uh, operation of this muscle that surrounds the collecting lymphatics uh, to drive or propel lymph forward uh, to the lymph node. And also, once arriving uh, cells and molecules arrive to the lymph node, similar types of vessels propel lymph out of the lymph node, and eventually that lymph dumps into the bloodstream, as you can see uh, at the thoracic duct in panel A. Um, so that's a general sort of generic overview of the three components of the lymphatic vasculature. Um, and I'm going to be focusing today on uh, the intestine. And so here's a cartoon of uh, the intestinal wall. Uh, and the uh, uh, element that I want to point you to in this cartoon is the mesentery. 
that yellowish type of fat tissue that's showing in the upper right. Um, and this mesentery is housing the blood vessels that enter the intestine and so supply the blood to the intestine. But also, um, of course, then the venous vasculature leaving the intestine is, is uh, parsing through this mesentery as well as the lymphatics, and particularly those pumping, collecting lymphatics that I just showed on the last slide would be housed in the mesenteric adipose tissue, um, along with uh, uh, other outbound features like uh, nerves, which I won't uh, uh, have time to talk about today. Um, but generally speaking, uh, we, we then come to the question of, since the intestine is home to a vast array of microorganisms, indeed, more microbes than the number of cells in our body. Um, how does uh, the intestine control the risk of dissemination of these of microbial or inflammatory signals uh, um, out of this uh, structure uh, through the mesentery? Um, and I'm only gonna touch on a couple of the mechanisms that we are working on, um, but uh, indeed uh, the resources uh, will lead you to reviews that will hit on even more uh, in this topic. And so as, a, as a, a sort of next step in thinking about this, I want to point to kind of a, a zoomed out view of the body where we can see the blood vasculature and the lymphatic vasculature in the entire anatomy. And this is, of course, not to scale, um, but what you see here in red is uh, arterial blood and blue venous blood. And at the bottom of this cartoon is a uh, any given tissue, you see a capillary bed, and the green vessels that are, are, are nearby this blood capillary bed are the initial lymphatics blind ended that are draining that tissue. And so you can see if your eye you know, follows this green line, the lymph nodes uh, that I've already discussed that lead back to the vasculature. And I wanna point out that these lymph nodes, in addition to hosting an immune response, uh, which is in the field of immunology, what we spend a lot of time thinking about, they're also critical for limiting the dissemination uh, 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 from all organs uh, back to the blood vasculature. And this is very important uh, because in fact, protecting the blood vasculature is uh, critical for health to prevent septic shock or disseminated intravascular coagulation. And so um, an example uh, would be uh, shown here in this cartoon where in some tissues, one might indeed have bacteria um, that would be captured by the lymph node and prevented from entering the bloodstream and thereby protecting against uh, uh, um, uh, septic shock or, or disseminated intravascular coagulation. Um, and additionally, some immune cells here shown as tissue factor or factor three positive antigen presenting cells uh, can be captured by the lymph node and not actually leave the lymph node. Um, and factor three is known to initiate coagulation. So the fact that the lymph node is capturing this is very important. Uh, another feature of this cartoon is actually showing tumor cells. So if you imagine a tumor growing in a tissue, what we now appreciate is that um, there can, of course, be metastases to lymph nodes, but at least in some types of cancers, the metastases to lymph nodes do not further dis disseminate. The lymph node stops them, if you will, and the distal metastases in the same uh, patients will actually be from different clones. So overall, the, the body is designed, and I've highlighted the lymphatic uh, uh, and lymph node partnership uh, to prevent uh, and protect the blood vasculature, prevent dissemination of uh, harmful signals that, that would uh, be detrimental if they uh, reach the blood. But I want to keep focusing on this image, and I want you to look at the uh, part of the uh, um, cartoon on the left that shows the intestine. Um, and that is uh, just you know slightly leftward toward uh, from the spleen. And what you can see is you can see again the green lymphatics that are leaving the intestine. But note that the lymph uh, that the blood vasculature of, of the intestine shows blue vessels leaving the intestine, moving over to the liver. So one of the anatomical features um, that um, is really critical for how our, our anatomy is arranged is that the venous vasculature coming from the intestine is filtered by the largest organ in the body, and that is the liver. Um, and it 
really uniquely so because most organs are um, um, uh, patterned in a different way. The vast majority of blood, although not all of the blood reaching the liver, is actually coming from the venous blood of the intestine. And so the intestine, the, the, the liver provides a fantastic filter uh, for capturing uh, microorganisms or inflammatory signals that might leave via the venous blood rather than the lymphatic vasculature. But what I'll talk about today is also that that, that puts a pressure on the liver and uh, to potentially actually be a victim of the dissemination of microorganisms that might come from the microbiome rich intestine. And we'll talk about uh, at least some ways in which the uh, liver combats uh, that problem. And indeed, what we can point to here is that because the intestine is physiologically designed to take up nutrients, um, one can envision what you could call the enterohepatic dilemma. That is, the small intestine in particular must stay poised for nutrient absorption, but that uh, poise itself potentially sets up uh, the intestine for promoting dissemination of unwanted signals uh, that might come from the microbiome. And so on the cartoon on the left, you can see a schem schematized view of carbohydrates and proteins that become polypeptides in the digestive system that are being absorbed by the units of the small intestine. So each one of these units here is a villus. And the green vessel that you see in a villus is the lymphatic vessel draining um, um, that villus. And the lymphatic vessel is surrounded by a blood capillary network. So that network eventually uh, um, will lead to the portal vein that I showed you in the last slide uh, that leads uh, uh, to the liver. Um, so carbohydrates and polypeptides are entering there. And the picture on the right that's an electron micrograph shows how these capillaries have uh, pores in them called fenestrae that promote uh, absorption of, of molecules. Um, um, of, of the polypeptide or carbohydrate uh, type. Now, interestingly, uh, the lipids in our diet are taken up uh, separately uh, uh, and uh, through the lymphatic vasculature. But overall, as I pointed to, there's this possibility of potentially bringing in microbial signals. And a very common microbial um, uh, component would be lipopolysaccharide or LPS, uh, which is uh, common or a, a feature of gram-negative bacterial cell walls. And so what you can see from these data uh, that the portal vein draining the intestine is enriched in LPS uh, compared with another vein that has uh, dissemination of inflammatory signals that is occurring. Now, one of the ways in which this might be combated is the fact that lipids, in fact, are not absorbed uh, through the portal vein, uh, but in fact, enter that green vessel, the lymphatic, uh, uh, initial lymphatic, um, and actually do not route to the liver. And this type of packaging of fats in our diet uh, occurs in a lipoprotein type called the chylomicron. Uh, in the center of the chylomicron is really rich in triglycerides and cholesterol as depicted here. So the chylomicron is one type of lipoprotein uh, in uh, our bodies. Another type, of course, is LDL, uh, which uh, one has measured every time essentially you go to your general practitioner. And LDL, or low-density lipoprotein, is not made by the intestine, as chylomicrons are, but is made by the liver. And I didn't notice that. The labeling for the, the lipoproteins is not completely shown here. So that smallest lipoprotein, uh, so you see the chylomicron as the largest, the second one is LDL, and the smallest one is high-density lipoprotein, or HDL. Sometimes this is called good cholesterol. And so what we have uh, come to realize, actually, over many decades is that uh, HDL is made by the liver, uh, but it's also made by the intestine. Uh, but what has not been clear and what I want to talk about today is um, what is the purpose of the intestine making that HDL and how is it potentially related to control of dissemination? Um, and so um, I I'm going to um, now talk about uh, HDL uh, in, and lipoproteins in general in relation to controlling microbial signals. So um, a signal like LPS 
which is very abundant, um, as I mentioned, in gram negative bacteria and definitely more abundant in the communication between the intestine and the liver, is um, driving inflammation through um, TLR4, toll-like receptor 4. Um, and this is um, a, a signaling cascade that requires the lipid portion of LPS uh, to be um, uh, made um, um, uh, recognizable by our immune system uh, by lipid binding protein. So LPS binding protein, or LBP, binds to the fatty acid chains in LPS um, and then this um, will allow transfer of the LPS to a, an immune molecule called CD14. And CD14 is either on the surface of macrophages or it's soluble, and then it's called SCD14. Um, and this um, serves as a relay system, all the while, um, um, you know, uh, get, transferring the fatty acids, uh, hiding them in a hydrophobic pocket until finally uh, uh, the LPS molecule is transferred to the MD2 TLR4 complex on the surface of cells and macrophages in particular are very rich in TLR4. And we know that this will activate NF-kappa B and drive a, a, a pro-inflammatory signal. So all of these molecules from LBP to CD14 to TLR4 are generally pro-inflammatory. Now, because LPS has fatty acyl chains as part of its molecule, uh, the molecule and is in fact critical for its signaling, one might assume that it can bind to lipoproteins that carry lipids. And indeed, we know that this is uh, the case. And it's very interesting to look in the literature and reflect back that since the mid 90s or so, we've known that LVP, um, in fact, can not uh, only deliver LPS to CD14, but also um, to um, lipoproteins like reconstituted HDL that's shown here. Um, and indeed, in this work that I cite here from 1995, um, it was clear that this uh, transfer of LPS via uh, LBP to HDL could neutralize uh, the LPS uh, um, and, and uh, reduce its ability to drive inflammation. Um, but what is not so clear is if this is a feature of all lipoproteins and really how it works at the uh, physiological level. Um, and that's what uh, I am now going to present, an exciting observation that we've recently made, that HDL made from the intestine in particular is especially um, um, able to neutralize LPS that leaves the intestine and control dissemination of its signaling. Um, so uh, let me talk about HDL trafficking a bit more and bring it into relation to the blood and lymphatic vasculature that I introduced early on. So in this cartoon, what you see is HDL not made by the intestine, but made by the liver. Um, and generally speaking, this is the source of HDL that has been studied uh, most significantly in the literature. And so what you see in the cartoon is that HDL uh, leaves the liver after it, it is synthesized uh, and moves into the bloodstream and crosses by transit epithelial transport into tissues. And in that interstitial space in the various tissues of our body, HDL will undergo remodeling. And one of the types of remodeling that's particularly significant is that cells that are sitting in a tissue will transfer free cholesterol into the HDL via the, uh, via the molecule called ABCA1. So this is a transporter on the surface um, of cells. Uh, macrophages have um, a rich uh, expression of ABCA1, but other cells can express it as well. And as that HDL moves through the tissue, it's not entering the cell, but rather continues as an intact and remodeling particle, and eventually will leave the tissue via the lymphatics um, and, and make its way back to the bloodstream through the thoracic duct in the way that I introduced early on. And so this is um, the HDL cycle as we've understood it. And my laboratory over the years has particularly worked on the role of HDL in leaving tissues through the limb. And for all we knew until recently, uh, uh, all HDL and tissues left via the lymphatics. But what this cartoon does not show is the intestine 
and the fact that, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, intestine serves as an additional source of HDL. And so now I've drawn uh, the cartoon of the intestine over on the left. And the intestinal epithelial cells, which you see in this beige color, are known to express uh, the key molecules that uh, actually uh, uh, remodel and uh, make up the HDL molecule. And these include that transporter, ABCA1, uh, donating cholesterol to the protein ApoA1, which serves as the backbone for nascent HDL. And for everything that I've told you, you would assume that when the intestinal epithelial cells in beige make this molecule, it will enter that green vessel, the lymphatic uh, in the villus, enter the mesenteric lymphatics, which are shown uh, in this kind of yellowish color, and make its way eventually back to the bloodstream. Um, uh, but there was data in the literature um, that in fact uh, caused us to question uh, the possibility that that simple paradigm was correct and particularly the work of michael hayden in vancouver in 2006 caused us to wonder if maybe things were a bit different for hdl in the intestine and so before i move into that i just want you to visualize hdl i think a very nice analogy is that it's a molecule that's like a backpack it is actually circulating through tissues, as I have just gone through, and constantly remodeling, not only picking up cholesterol, which I went through, but also picking up different proteins that will uh, be present on or off the uh, HDL particle, depending on its overall shape and status. Uh, and so in that way, just like a backpack has different co components at different uh, uh, times and is used to transport, you can think of HDL as, in fact, a very complex macromolecular uh, entity uh, that moves around the body um, and uh, uh, removes cholesterol and carries out many other functions, including anti-inflammatory or antioxidant functions uh, through the action of various proteins. And that makes it a little challenging to study because if you want to study its movement through tissues, then you want to be sure that it's in whatever state that it's in, the various proteins that it might be associated with it, and those are hard to predict. So a few years ago, uh, my laboratory generated a mouse that would allow us uh, to study uh, the magnitude of HDL trafficking through tissues using a recombinant uh, um, molecule where uh, uh, a former postdoc in the laboratory, Paul Wong, who's pictured in the lower right, uh, in collaboration with Mary Sorcy Thomas and Mike Thomas, um, now in Wisconsin, um, generated a fusion protein of human ApoA1, and again, that's the protein backbone of HDL, where its in-terminus uh, contains, uh, encodes photoactivatable GFP. Uh, and this photoactivatable GFP domain is not fluorescing like uh, GFP that you might think of uh, as being a fluorescent green molecule, unless it is activated by light uh, that uh, uh, is shined upon it. So 405 nanometer light um, uh, will activate uh, uh, photoactivatable GFP to become fluorescent. And what Paul did was knock this fusion protein into the mouse ApoA1 locus. So basically replacing the mouse's HDL with this uh, photoactivatable HDL. And the first thing he did was he shined light on the skin and you can see the graph at the bottom uh, for the skin interstitium. He could collect the fluid and indeed if he shined light then the HDL would light up and we could see fluorescence intensity there. And that intensity wanes over time. And you can see in the upper graph that eventually this, uh, some of this fluorescence moves out to plasma. So that's actually HDL moving out of the skin tissue into lymphatics, uh, um, which is described in the paper, I'm not showing you the lymphatic part here, and, uh, and back into the bloodstream. And you can quantify this and study its kinetics. So we started doing this, and one of the things that we definitely wanted to do with this uh, new mouse tool uh, was uh, to think about trafficking from the intestine uh, with the curiosity that we had that things might be different in the intestine. And so I'll walk you through that here. 
And um, again, I pointed out that the work of Michael Hayden uh, is the a work that caused us to think about uh, the intestine as a potentially interesting place uh, for uh, HDL biology. And one of the ways that one can study this is using an intestinal specific Cree, uh, the villain Cree, which you see by the Delta VIL here, where the villain Cree is used to uh, knock out ABCA1. So those are the pink bars or the albumin Cree, uh, which will be active in a liver specific manner to knock out ABCA1. That's again, the, the cholesterol donating transporter uh, in HDL biogenesis in the liver. Um, and then the white bars are the litter mate controls where there's been no deletion of the flox allele of ABCA1. Um, and so what you can see if you look at those white bars first off is the part of the intestine that expresses the molecules like ABCA1 for HDL generation is in fact uh, the ileum. And so this is the very end of the small intestine and that's where the microbiome is richest. So one can still see absorption in this location under uh, certain circumstances and bile acids of course are also reabsorbed there, but the microbiome is very rich. Um, and the HDL is made there. Now, you can also see that if we use our crease that we get good deletion in the right uh, tissues uh, uh, based on the blue and pink colors. Now, um, what we did next off was to actually do uh, a chromatogram uh, on an FPLC of uh, the lipoproteins in blood and at the very uh, bottom of this graph that I just brought up, the systemic serum, we repeated exactly what Michael Hayden's group had shown that if you knock out the intestinal HDL biogenesis, again in the pink, compared with the control, which is in black, that one loses HDL in the circulation by about 25%. And this seems minor compared to the results when you knock it out of the liver, where you lose it by more than 75%. But what's important here is this systemic serum is actually a vein that is not draining the intestine, but rather, um, uh, uh, in fact, you would see this in most other venous supplies of the body. But if you went to the vein that, that drains the intestine, and supplies the liver with its majority of blood, the portal serum, really a different result was seen. And so you can see that in the upper right, that the pink bar in the portal serum is extremely small compared with the control bar in gray. So HDL that's uh, in the blood leading to the liver requires that the intestine expresses the HDL. And this was really a profound uh, observation uh, we felt. It seems to imply that, uh, that, that in fact, uh, the portal blood really only has one source of HDL and that would be the intestine. So to confirm and extend this observation, we used our mouse where we could photo activate. And so if you look on the picture of Yoda at the bottom, you can see Yoda shining a laser uh, into the lumen of the intestine. So that uh, uh, is a, a picture of a villus and you're inside the lumen of the ileum. Um, and Yang Hyun Han, the uh, first author of this particular uh, research, uh, made a little slit in the intestine, shined light there, and then, and then he did a time course. So if you look at that graph in the upper left, you can see that in five minutes in the gray bar, that's the portal venous blood, compared with five minutes in the white bar, which is the systemic blood, there's a lot more uh, fluorescence that it's appeared in the venous blood. And if you look at the middle uh, graph, and that's in yellow, you can see that in the five to 10 minutes that it took us to gather any lymph that was draining the blood, we didn't see any increase in signal over baseline. But we finally did see that the whole uh, uh, a group of the different places we were looking, systemic, portal, or lymph, would normalize by 30 minutes. Uh, but certainly the first place that the signal of this fluorescent HDL went was in the portal circulation, not the lymph. Now we got a different result. If you look at that very last bar in the upper left that says outside of SI, which is outside the small intestine, if we moved the laser over to the outside of the small intestine, so we opened up the mouse and surgically shined the light on the outside of the intestine, then in fact, we would see the signal entering the lymph very quickly in five to 10 minutes. So if you put all that together, what we could see is that if the intestinal epithelium is making HDL, it goes only to the portal circulation that feeds the liver. 
Some of this will lead the liver in equilibrate over a 30 minute period and enter the systemic circulation. So eventually it'll make its way back to the intestine in part, but that must be leaving the blood circulation and entering the interstitium and get picked up by the lymph. So HDL that's made from the intestine actually makes more of a cinnamon roll kind of a transport rather than an actual circle. Um, and we thought that was interesting, but we wanted to know if it had any immunological, uh, immunophysiological significance. Um, and, I, and we started to then characterize the type of HDL that we could find in the portal blood versus the systemic blood. And here you can see um, in A, actually we obtained uh, portal blood and systemic blood from six different human individuals undergoing surgeries where we could access the portal vein. Um, and then in the panel B, you see uh, parallel data in mice. And what's very clear is that um, either by looking, which is the, the, the uh, 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 gels on the left, or um, by um, um, non-denaturing gel electrophoresis, or using electron microscopy in the middle, uh, we would see that the HDL in the portal circulation was a smaller lipoprotein particle than one sees in the systemic circulation. And we further characterized a few key proteins that are known to be more associated with a smaller type of HDL that's in the literature referred to often as HDL3. And some of those proteins are PON1 or peroxinase 1, an antioxidant molecule. And indeed, this is known to be a characteristic protein of HDL3. Um, and it was also enriched in the portal uh, type of HDL that we saw. So we conclude that the gut makes HDL that is mainly a subspecies of HDL called HDL3. And in the systemic circulation, you see a broader range of HDL sizes and types, but really quite uh, uh, limited to HDL3 in the portal vein. So that small size may allow it to enter those portal fenestrae more easily, but it might also have immunological uh, um, implications Locations due to the types of proteins that are associated with it. So the next thing we did, and this is a really an abbreviated version of a, of a large proteomics uh, analysis that we made on HDL that um, we purified from the portal blood or the systemic blood using either a density centrifugation method, which in the upper left is shown as KBR using a potassium bromide uh, um, a density centrifugation technique that's been in the, in the field for a very long time, or we used another technique where we used FPLC to take the HDL rich fractions and then further immunopurify them or immunoprecipitate them using an anti apoa one antibody. And the thing I want to particularly point out is that HDL3, either in systemic or portal HDL, if it was isolated using the gentle immunoprecipitation technique, was found to be associated with LBP. That's the LPS binding protein that I showed you earlier was critical for LPS signaling to drive inflammation. Now, this is interesting to us for multiple reasons. It seems to potentially imply that maybe this HDL3 will drive uh, LPS signaling because we have this uh, protein that uh, is essential for LPS signaling associated with it. Um, but also LBP is actually in the same family of lipoprotein remodeling enzymes uh, uh, like cholesterol ester transfer protein or PLTP that are well known in the cardiovascular field for remodeling lipoproteins. But, um, and indeed LBP has a binding pocket for the lipids of LPS um, that is um, uh, in, uh, you know, structurally related to uh, um, proteins that we know remodel uh, uh, lipoproteins. And so we were very curious is the HDL3 that is associated with LBP in the portal vein actually making uh, the portal um, um, uh, supply of HDL pro-inflammatory because it would be able to present LPS uh, to the liver. And we, we recognize that in the liver, it's going to be the macrophage expressing high levels of TLR4 that's going to be very sensitive to inflammation. So what we next did was isolate the macrophages of the liver, and these are called Cooper cells. And so these are primary cultures of Cooper cells from livers. Um, and then what we did in panel A and B is we um, treated them in culture with LPS. 
and the LPS was added in the presence of a vehicle or in the presence of systemic HDL. So you see SHDL. And if it says H in front of it, that's from a human source. And if it says in panel B, M in front of it, it's a mouse source. So S stands for systemic HDL and P stands for portal HDL. And what you can see is we kept the amount of LPS constant, uh, but if we added more, if we added in the presence of the portal HDL, the level of inflammatory genes that came up in these cultured macrophages in response to LPS was greatly dampened by the portal source of HDL, showing that this HDL was really neutralizing, whether from a human or a mouse source, um, the, um, the LPS signaling. Now, in the lower panel, uh, panel D, we show this using uh, commercial sources of HDL2 and 3 that came only from the systemic circulation. But what's very important here is that you do see the HDL3 is the most potent neutralizer of LPS signaling. And this is, of course, not working in a TLR4 knockout macrophage, so showing it's TLR4 dependent. But the thing that we had to do in panel D is we had to add LBP and for, and for this HDL3 to actually neutralize. So in panel D, we had purified the HDL using the density centrifugation method, and this causes the LBP to dissociate from the HDL. So when we added it back, that's when we were able to see that the HDL3 would, in a dose-dependent manner, reduce uh, inflammatory activation. So Cooper cells can make, for example, CCL2, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule recruiting monocytes. Um, and the more HDL that's present, and this is clearly still within the physiologic uh, uh, dose of HDL, um, as long as LBP was present, it would block um, the uh, activation of Cooper cells, not promote it. Um, as you might have potentially predicted since LBP is, is required for TLR4 signaling. But here it appears to be blocking. Um, and indeed, if you actually uh, try to quantify using a limulus assay, it's called LAL, it's an activity of LPS. It's often used in laboratories to quantify LPS. What we could see is that in the presence of LBP, the HDL3 would even make uh, the assay to, uh, suggest that there was less LPS present. So uh, uh, other experiments that I'm not going to show actually argued that, in fact, there was less binding. So in fact, what we find here is that um, it, it turns out that the L L HDL is even preventing the LPS from being recognized by Cooper cells. And we could see this recognition using a flow cytometry approach, uh, which is shown here where flow chromatographs are shown uh, on the top part of the data set. And what we've done here is use a biotinylated form of LPS um, that allows us to detect it with a strepavidin floor. And you can see that, that uh, when LPS is added uh, to Cooper cells, you can see the shift to the right in that little box there. But in the presence of HDL3, as long as LBP was also present, uh, in fact, binding was even prevented. Um, and so this was, um, 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 uh, in fact, really interesting to us uh, because it caused us to wonder is, could it be that the intestine actually protects the liver? Some LPS is always going to be leaking from the intestine, but this HDL may prevent it um, from being uh, recognized in a, a highly pro-inflammatory way. And so I'm not going to walk you through the in vivo data, but we carried out several models of liver injury that are known to be of intestinal origin. And one of these is a resection of the intestine. This is called a, a small bowel resection um, that uh, would lead to um, liver failure and fibrosis. And in fact, uh, 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 children who have necrotizing enterocolitis will sometimes have a really dramatic surgical removal of parts of the small intestine and this would um, um, uh, lead to, uh, in many cases, after surviving the surgery and the, and the uh, uh, associations acutely, the chronic problem is liver failure um, associated with fibrosis. And this can be modeled in the mouse, and you can see that here, the pink staining with 75% small bowel resection shows that the liver, over time after this intestine is removed, is becoming fibrotic. And what we show in uh, uh, the resource that I put here, and I'm not gonna have time to go through this, is in fact, the intestine 
made by HDL because it neutralizes LPS actually protects the liver from this um, uh, LPS mediated damage in a small bowel resection model or in a high fat diet feeding model or even in an alcohol uh, injury model. Um, an alcohol feeding model, that the intestine makes uh, HDL to neutralize LPS. And once uh, uh, it arrives to the liver, the Cooper cell, which is shown here in this cartoon in gray, cannot see it, therefore does not react in a pro-inflammatory manner. Um, and uh, this spares uh, uh, the liver. So this is a critical mechanism, we would argue, that may have um, um, uh, real pharmacological uh, targets associated with it to, in, uh, to prevent liver injury um, uh, that is arising from injury of the intestine. But let me just spend then the last uh, uh, a few minutes on coming back to the lymphatics. So I talked about HDL, which we initially thought might be moving through the lymphatics, but in fact moved through the portal vein. But what about injury through the lymphatics? Are there ways in which the intestine limits uh, dissemination of inflammatory injury there? And I've already pointed to lymph nodes as uh, the, their capacity to uh, prevent dissemination. Uh, as well. Uh, but there may be scenarios where that uh, role of the lymph node is not sufficient. And one such scenario could be inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease, which is pictured uh, in a schematized way here on the right. And the areas of the bowel that can be affected by Crohn's disease are shown in the deeper red color to uh, signify inflammation. And I want to point out uh, that you can see here the small bowel, so the, the, the thinner part of the bowel entering the colon, that uh, that uh, terminal region there is the uh, ileum, and that's the most commonly inflamed site in Crohn's patients. And there has been uh, the idea for decades that the lymphatics might be involved uh, in Crohn's disease physiology. And we um, um, got very interested in this a few years ago and could in fact find that um, there were, and so this gets back to the picture that I showed at the very beginning, there were in fact new lymphoid follicles that were forming along the lymphatics uh, that would feed to the lymph node, essentially as if adding almost extra lymph Void tissue along a lymphatic line uh, that, that fed to the lymph node. And these follicles were very rich in B cells, which express CD20. And that's the red staining shown here on the left. Um, but we were concerned uh, because as I introduced, of course, lymph nodes can prevent dissemination. Maybe these lymphoid structures also prevent dissemination uh, in the context of Crohn's disease. Um, it was very hard, to, that data that I just showed you is actually coming from resected tissue in humans. Um, and in order to make progress in asking what these lymphoid follicles are doing, we needed a mouse model. And indeed, we have found that uh, a mouse model of ileitis, which has been argued in the literature for about 20 years to be um, a good model for uh, Crohn's disease, just like the patients, in fact, um, we could find that they that these mice uh, develop uh, lymphoid follicles in the mesentery. So you're looking at in panel E a picture of uh, the small intestine, uh, and the area where the lymph node is 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 uh, uh, abbreviated as mes lymph node. And you can see the fat is the kind of uh, white shadowy part, and that fat holds the lymphatics that drain down to that lymph node. And I hope you can appreciate that on the right you can see the lymphoid. Uh, tissue developing. These are the, the mice that get the ileitis because they carry this altered TNF mRNA called delta ARE. So loss of the AU rich response element leads to this ileitis. Um, uh, and the, the, the mouse on the left is the control litter mate that has the normal uh, TNF locus. It does not develop ileitis and you don't see these lymphoid follicles developing. And just like in the human, they are very rich in B cells, which are uh, seen by B220 staining in flow cytometry on the left. Now, what is thought to happen in these mice is the TNF is generated because the microbiome induces some cells to make TNF and in the uh, mutation, uh, that TNF is more stable. And so it allows for the development of, of ileitis. And of course, in Crohn's patients, we know that TNF is um, a major uh, uh, driver of disease as well. But when we look at these tertiary lymphoid structures a little closer, 
I want to uh, refer back to the valves that I showed at the very beginning, that lymphatic valves drive forward flow to the lymph node. And some of the valves are, are shown by yellow arrows in this slide. And what you can see is that the follicles are, are the cells that are very rich in the green MHC class two staining. And areas where the green staining um, is shown, if you, you know, if this is the same image on the left, but the green staining has been removed. You can see where the follicles are most developed. The, the valve is gone. Um, and the area where you can see valves that are highlighted in yellow, actually you already start to see some uh, MHC class two positive cells. So these would be B cells and macrophages sitting around them. And what we now know, and this, this work is in press and immunity, is that these valves are losing their identity because TNF changes genes that would normally uh, maintain valves and allows for lymphangiogenesis. And, and indeed, this is the area where immune cells are attracted and the lymphangiogenesis creates a, a tertiary lymphoid structure uh, that forms around them. And I'm going to skip this slide in the interest of time, but what it shows is that these structures actually cause cells leaving the intestine, which we light up using a photoconvertible uh, um, a mouse where all the cells in the ileum are, 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 are uh, experiencing a light shift so that they turn red when we shine light on that area, we could follow the red cells out. Um, and in the TNF Delta ARE mouse, they end up, as you can see in the lower left, getting trapped in these mesentery structures, uh, the new tertiary lymphoid structures. But um, it wasn't just the immune cells that get trapped. It also turns out that really any molecules that are disseminating from the intestine get trapped. And we could see this uh, by creating a mouse surgical sort of in, vi in vivo imaging scenario where we pull the mesentery over a, um, a, a warm plate um, and, and expose the CLVs, the collecting lymphatic vessels, and then inject one microliter of high molecular weight Fitzy dextran into the intestinal wall. We actually inject the Pyres patch because this is the easiest place uh, to make the injection. And then we could study dissemination. And the, the first movie that's playing here shows the control, the situation that exactly what you expect based on my introduction, that the dye that we inject moves forward to the draining lymph node through the lymphatic vasculature. And this happens very fast in just a few minutes. Uh, but the, the next thing we wanted to know was what happens when the TLOs are present. So what you see here is a mouse with ileitis that has TLOs. And the, in fact, over one hour, the mesenteric lymph node never receives the tracer. So these TLOs do in fact prevent dissemination of even these molecular tracers to the lymph node. And if anything, they move back toward the gut um, and some of the tracer is actually leaking uh, from the TLOs. Um, now, we, so we think that these have both positive and negative uh, uh, consequences on the disease. They sort of entrap the inflammation, but at the same time, they prevent dissemination of inflammation to other parts of the body. And one of the things from a physiologic perspective that we know uh, in collaboration with um, uh, lymphatic physiologist Mike Davis at the University of Missouri, he was able to put a servo null micro, pipe, uh, micro uh, pipette into the lumen of these lymphatics and measure the pressure at inside of the lymphatic collecting vessel in the mouse. And in red, you see the area just upstream and around these tertiary lymphoid structures. And the pressure is very elevated compared with the surrounding regions. So what we know is that essentially these structures are creating a kind of pressure cuff around the lymphatic, which you can sort of see visually here in the upper left, a cross section of a three-dimensional view of a TLO. And that actually serves to inhibit dissemination of cells and molecules. Um, and again, our ongoing research would suggest that this is both positive and negative simultaneously. The, the positive uh, is that dissemination of inflammatory mediators from the gut really are, there's extra, um, I, so I drew in a few extra lymphoid tissues here compared with the cartoon I showed earlier, extra uh, uh, strategies 
and extra lymphoid tissue to prevent outflow. And these are particularly operating kind of by enhancing pressure to shut down the system, which is different than how lymph nodes work. Um, and this, when you combine it with uh, the former part of my talk, you know, allows the in, uh, intestine, I've shown you one venous and one lymphatic strategy for controlling uh, dissemination. And the, the venous strategy was um, HDL and protecting against microbial lipid or LPS dissemination uh, to protect the liver. So with this, I'm going to end and I would be happy uh, to take any questions uh, that you have. I, I hope you enjoyed the talk. I wanna highlight several important individuals uh, uh, who were um, critical for uh, the execution of this work. Uh, so Yang Hyun Han is now at, in his own laboratory in Korea and he's uh, listed here. He carried out the HDL work after the um, photoactivatable uh, HDL mouse was made by Paul Wong, um, uh, also now a former member of the laboratory who is currently in Shanghai. Uh, Rafael Chepilevsky, the first name listed in my laboratory on the upper left and shown in the picture uh, uh, wearing the black shirt in the upper right next to uh, Dr. Han. Um, uh, it carried out the lymphatic tracing work in collaboration uh, with Mike Davis at the University of Missouri and Baron Zinzelmeyer um, uh, uh, in my group, whose name is listed uh, last uh, on my list, who's really an uh, intervital imaging specialist uh, in our group. And I also want to thank uh, many others, including the Cleveland Digestive Disease Research Center, which really made the TNF Delta ARE mouse model uh, possible for us to study along uh, with um, support from the NIH uh, and the Kenneth Rainan uh, Foundation that allowed us to uh, really get interested and, and, and start making progress in IBD research just in the last few years. Um, so yes, now I'm happy to take questions um, as there's time. Fantastic, thanks so much, Gwen, for the excellent presentation. Um, okay, let's jump right in here. Um, it's kind of a general question, Gwen, but uh, can you just clarify what's the mechanism for the removal of neutralized LPS? Yes. So uh, as I pointed out, so LBP is interacting with, as one of the cargo proteins on the HDL particle. It appears to, in ways that structurally we don't completely understand, but it appears to to physically mask, we think, the ability of LPS to be uh, transferred to CD14. Um, um, and so we actually think that binding site is blocked. Uh, so once then it arrives to the liver, the TLR4 doesn't see it. It actually can flow out of the liver. But what we do know is that it um, um, eventually does get recognized by another enzyme called acyl oxyacyl hydrolase, which can then cleave off the fatty acyl, acyl chains uh, and, um, and that essentially inactivates uh, the LPS. But the HDL portion of it appears to be that only HDL3 is the subspecies that can really bind to LBP. And when LBP is combined with HDL, instead of uh, promoting TLR4 signaling, it inhibits it by inhibiting recognition of the ligand. Fantastic. Great answer. Um, so uh, going back to your, uh, when you were talking about the flow of HDL, uh, was this analysis done in the jejunum, the ileum, or the large bowel? Um, so that's a good question. And uh, the analysis was done, um, actually, it, so if you go to the resource paper, uh, uh, so the whole data set would be available in one of the resource papers that I showed. So the data that I show in uh, the graph is actually a combination of uh, uh, activating a spot in the uh, duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. So you're seeing a combined outflow from the small intestine. We also, in other data in the paper, show the ileum, jejunum, and duodenum separately. And each of them do generate some signal, but the ileum generates the most. The paper does not show uh, any analysis of the large bowel. That is something that we're really interested to do in the future. So what's quite uh, intriguing to us is that the large bowel actually does not express APO81. And that seems initially counterintuitive because we know, of course, the large bowel is going to have quite a lot of LPS. But the large bowel is also not an absorptive 
area. So we think that the HDL is especially designed, you know, to to hit that enterohepatic dilemma that I was pointing out that when you're open to absorption, you have to have something there to counteract the uh, absorbing microbial signals. Um, so we, we, we do see a little signal when we photoactivate the colon, uh, but it's not nearly as much as the ileum. And from single cell sequencing from other groups, it appears as though the colon does not actually generate uh, HDL from the epithelium. Fantastic. Um, is the, the development of tertiary lymphoid structures in most models of colitis reversed following the reduction of mucosal inflammation? So that that's a good question, and the answer to that question will be elaborated on in the in the uh, I think our paper in immunity that I, I will be out in five days uh, as an early online, and then it will be in the December issue of Immunity. And what we find is that um, we actually treat the mice with a therapeutic you know an anti TNF to mimic the anti TNF that many patients are given, and uh, what we find is that if we start the therapeutic before or at a very early stage that the TLOs are developing. And we begin to see them about eight weeks of age in this spontaneous ileitis model, that that can definitely prevent the further progression and a, a onset of more TLOs. But once the TLOs have formed, um, the anti-TNF does not reverse uh, uh, their remodeling, but it can promote a, a, a loss of cellularity, you know, because they're accumulating uh, both fluid and cells and, and it can restore flow. But once these structures have developed, we think that they are really difficult to reverse. And so you sort of leave a scar. And eventually we show in the paper that as the mouse uh, ages, the disease also worsens in the model. And once you hit really highly developed TLOs, the anti-TNF really stops being able to uh, restore lymph flow. Um, because they've developed in such a way that, that uh, you know, it, 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 and they don't reverse. Um, so it's really hard to restore. So I think this is clinically um, um, uh, interesting, potentially, because it may be parallel to the clinical observation that when patients take anti-TNF early after diagnosis, they have a better uh, uh, a chance of that therapy actually being efficacious as compared with um, anti-TNFs that are started at a later disease, uh, disease stage. And so we're curious if in fact, the development of TLOs may um, be one of the uh, considerations in the efficacy of that anti-inflammatory therapy. Perfect, yeah, another great answer there. Um, all right, I think in the interest of time, we'll just have uh, time for one more question. Uh, do you know if LDL lowering agents like niacin could allow bacterial or LPS dissemination more from the gut? So I, I think the question probably needs to be, so, so niacin has been uh, shown in humans to be able to raise HDL. However, um, um, and, and, and it can potentially lower. So, in this model, if you recall, so we're not studying mice uh, uh, in a scenario where they have hypercholesterolemia. So really we don't have high VLDL and LDL in mice is very low. Um, so we're very interested now in to get into other animal models where LDL is relevant, um, but niacin in, uh, um, in some animal models can raise HDL and in, in humans, um, we do not know if it raises HDL from an intestinal source. And so really the answer to your question is not yet known. Um, but of course, what we're really interested in pharmacologically and what we show in the paper is that we can use other strategies like LXR agonist orally to hit the intestine to raise HDL and that is protective. Um, so we don't have an answer with respect to niacin per se, and the mouse model that we have is really not nicely designed to address that question. Uh, but we do already, and we published in the in this story, uh, have some evidence that raising HDL from the intestine will protect the liver in a wide variety of models. And we're very interested in seeing that go forward as a potential therapeutic strategy to, uh, uh, to, to um, treat liver disease of, of intestinal, uh, associated with intestinal injuries. 
Fantastic. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, so, well, thanks so much, Gwen, for the really great insights today. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. You're welcome. Yeah, I enjoyed it too. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a big thanks also to the audience here for joining us today. And we look forward to having you with us again soon. Have a great day, everyone.